Good morning, everyone. My name is Karina Smith, and I want to welcome you to our third lecture in this series. Today, we are going to be talking about subversive orthodoxy. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you today, as well as welcoming our speaker. And so let's go ahead and do, give a word of prayer, and then I'll introduce our speaker, Ms. Lisa Fields, who is here with us today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this opportunity to come before your throne of grace and mercy. Lord, we welcome you into this space and invite you to have your way. We thank you for the ways in which you are pouring into us through these speakers in this series. And we ask that today, Lord, you open up the eyes of our understanding, that you would knit together our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, and our souls, that we may be able to get the information that you want to pour into us, that we may take it and use it to glorify you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, so today we're going to have about 40 minutes for a lecture. And after the lecture, we will have an opportunity for about 15 minutes to have some Q&A time, questions and answers. And so I do invite you, as we are going along, to enter any questions um, you may have into the chat feature. And then after that, we will close. And so at this time, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you Lisa Fields. Lisa Victoria Fields grew up as a pastor's kid. However, she had no ministry ambitions. Growing up, Lisa wanted to be a stockbroker and she planned to move to New York and work on Wall Street, but God had another plan for her. In 2005, Lisa started her undergraduate career at the University of North Florida with a major in investment finance. It was during the end of her first year of college that she encountered God in a very real way. She then began to pursue God like never before. She decided to take a religion course at UNF to cultivate a deeper knowledge of God's word. However, she was shocked on her first day of class when her New Testament professor declared, I am going to change everything you thought you knew about Jesus. With this statement, her professor quickly shattered her expectations for the course. Lisa was presented with information about the Bible that she had never encountered. And the professor focused on biblical contradictions and text criticism. Lisa's faith was challenged on a level that it had never been challenged before. And it forced her to rethink what she believed. Through months of prayer and reflection, Lisa was faced with a decision believe the Bible or abandon the faith. She chose the Bible. However, not with blind faith, but faith informed by theological evidence. Since that time, Lisa has been on a mission to equip believers with the tools to defend the faith. She believes that one of the greatest tools to defend the faith is biblical literacy. Lisa graduated from the University of North Florida with a Bachelor's of Science in Communications and Religious Studies and Liberty University with a Master's of Divinity with a focus in theology. Lisa is the founder and president of the Jew Three Project. She has spoken at evangelism, apologetic and biblical literacy events at various universities and churches, and she has a passion for teaching the word of God. In addition to her work in ministry, Lisa hosts a, a secular podcast for young professionals called Brunch Culture. She believes it's important for Christians to engage the culture and represent a biblical worldview. And above all, Lisa hopes to be marked by her love for God and people, because in her mind, that is the only thing that really matters. So if you would please welcome me Please join me in welcoming Ms. Lisa Fields as our lecturer today. Lisa, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to be with you all uh, at TED's. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank Dr. Powell and TED's for the invitation. It is an honor to be with you. I'm glad it's over Zoom and not in person because it's nice spring weather here in Florida. And I'm sure De Deerfield doesn't have the same plight as us Floridians as it relates, relates to weather. Um, as Karina mentioned, I am Lisa Fields. I lead in the Christian Apologetics Org called the Jew Three Project. It's uh, focused 
um, on Christian apologetics that helps the Black community know what they believe and why. And I'm excited to talk to you today on lessons from the Black church, engaging society through apologetics. Um, before we get into the apologetic lessons from the Black church for society today, I think we ought to expand how we think about apologetics in general. Um, I know most of us on this line today are seminarians, um, so I don't need to define apologetics in the general sense. You all know that I'm sure it comes, I'm sure you all know that it comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a defense. First Peter um, 3.15, we ought to be able to give a defense uh, for the hope that uh, we have with gentleness and respect. However, I think sometimes when we think about apologetics, our perspective is limited on intellectual engagement. And I think it's important as we talk about apologetics in the Black church that we expand our view of apologetics. One of the most helpful uh, uh, definitions of a holistic approach for apologetics that I've read came out of the Encyclopedia of Popular Apologetics by Ed Heinsohn and Ergen Kanner. And they said apologetics has two tenets, informational and incarnational. In their book, they put it like this, informational apologetics represents the explanation of essential biblical tenets to the Christian faith. And so this is the understanding that we are most familiar with. However, this is only part of the equation and must con be considered in conjunction with what they call inf um, incarnational apologetics. And so incarnational apologetics represents the actualization of the biblical belief systems into authentic expressions of a believer's life. In a real sense, they put it this way, it's wrapping one's faith in the flesh of daily living. So I like to think of the two tenets of apologetics as wings on a plane. Uh, when you are about to board a plane, which wing would you rather have, uh, the left or the right one? I wanna just pause right there. When you get on a plane, do you think, man, I hope it has the left wing, I hope it has the right wing. No, nobody right thinks like uh, I would prefer one wing or the other because they understand that each wing is essential to flight. That if you don't have both wings, you can't take flight. And as I think about apologetics, I think about it in the same way. If we don't have informational, which is the knowledge and the tools to be able to defend the hope we have, to know how to intellectually engage, that's that's one wing. We, we could call that the left wing. But also we need the incarnational approach because it doesn't matter how well you intellectually defend the faith if you don't live the faith. You undercut the your informational apologetics if you don't have an in incarnational apologetic approach. And so I think as we expand our view of apologetics outside of just information to incarnational, it gives us a holistic approach. And it also helps us best see the black church as an apologetic tool that we can pull from. Because we understand apologetics isn't just simply about information, but it's about embodiment. In addition to providing a definition, a holistic definition for apologetics, I think um, I, won't, I should make some statements about the Black church more broadly. The first thing I want to say as we think about the Black church is the Black church, I use my hands in quotes for that, is a misnomer. And what do I mean by that? Um, there is no uniform Black church. However, there are Black churches. This is important to note because when we think, if we think there is a Black church, we'll see the Black church as a mon monolith and we'll develop caricatures and generalizations that are not true of all Black churches. So wh what do I mean by that? So when we think of there is a Black church, we forget that there are various denominations of Black churches. So they're not all uniform. So there's uh, AME, there's Church of God in Christ, 
there's uh, Black Baptists in the National Baptist Convention, there's Progressive Baptist Convention, there's several Black major denominations. So there is no singular stream of thought always within all Black churches. So therefore, that's why I'm saying there's no the Black church. And to say there is the Black church as if they're all uniform is a misnomer. And so I think just like there are um, majority white churches that are Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, we have to think about Black churches in the same way. So we won't have a sweeping broad brush or caricatures when we talk about Black churches. So, so, how, so how do we know a church is a Black church? Um, number one, one of the reasons we, we know is it's a part of a historically Black denomination, whether that be AME, CME, National Baptist Convention, Church of God in Christ, PAW, uh, Pentecostal Assem um, Assembly of the World, those historically Black denominations, or it was affiliated at one point with a Black denomination, but chose to be independent. That's, that's one way we know. Number two, uh, it has an overwhelmingly majority of Black people in the church. So that's, that's another marker of a church being a Black church. Number three, it self-identifies as a Black church. Um, this is important going back to number two because a church can have an overwhelmingly majority of Black churches, but can still consider them to identify as a multi-ethnic church. They just haven't seen what they identify as come to complete fruition. And so we want to also add that, that part about them self-identifying as a black church, because there are some black, there are some churches that have a majority of black congregants, but want to identify in a broader space. So they identify in a multi-ethnic space, even though they're majority um, black attendees. Um, and, and also, identify themselves as a black church is important because there are some black churches that are connected uh, to um, white denominations that still identify as a black church. So that, that um, that's important to note. Uh, one I think would be in your area uh, would be like a Compassion Baptist Church that's in Chicago that's a part of a network called Convergent which is a more white denomination but it is but the church is historically black church or you have Trinity um, um, in Chicago, who is a part of the United um, uh, UCC, I believe, um, which is a white denomination, but they identify as a black church and it has been a historically black church. So I, I just wanna make those few distinctions um, before, before we move on. Now, why I said that there's no uh, monolith in black churches, there are some common threads through all, through most black churches. Um, most black churches have a high view of scripture, uh, the centrality of Jesus Christ, um, an understanding of Jesus being Lord and savior and dying for our sins, um, a belief in civic engagement and justice and a holistic view of salvation of forgiveness of sin, empowerment, and uplift of, of people on the margins. Now that we've got through kind of just a basic understanding of holistic apologetics and some a few thoughts about Black churches, um, how to identify them, and some common beliefs, I think it's important to talk about contributions of Black churches. Um, we have at the Jude 3 Project historic, a historically Black college and university tour. And one of um, the biggest topics in the community that we navigate with as it relates to apologetics is the argument that Christianity is a white man's religion. And so we attempt to answer this question on HBCU campuses um, in, by, in three different ways. Uh, we start by discussing early African Christian history. Then we move on to Christianity and slavery. And then we conclude with what I wanna to talk to you about for the next few moments, contributions of black churches 
in America. Um, we understand that it's not just important to discuss early African history to dispel the myth that Christianity is a white man's religion, but we discuss black church history in America as well. And so one of the things that we need to think about and one of the questions we need to answer today is why the black church? Well, Reverend Dr. Huber, Huber Brown responded to this question. And he said, when we look at the black church as an institution, it has no match, no equal, as it pertains to institutions that have brought tangible resources to the black community. For more than 300 years, black churches have been providing support in the way of mutual aid, legislative advocacy, training ground, and professional development. More than any other of the wonderful organizations that work on behalf or in the midst of the black community. The black church has no equal, has no rival in a way of producing concrete and material supports. It has created lasting results for more than three centuries. So the black church, he's saying has no rival there's other organizations in our community like the NAACP, the Urban League, and other social advocacy groups in the Black community that work in, in these areas of mutual aid, legislative advocacy, and training ground. But Dr. Brown is arguing that the Black church has done more than all of these other institutions. Even when we think about, as I mentioned before, historically Black colleges and universities, um, many people don't know that most of them were um, founded by Black churches and denominations. Howard University, for example, was founded in 1866 by a band of African-American missionaries to provide theological education to African-American pastors and preachers. In 1867, Morehouse was founded in the basement of Springfield Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. And the list can go on from North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama, Xavier in Louisiana. Um, when African-Americans had little access to resources due to slavery and discrimination, it was black churches who pulled their resources together to ensure each person had what they needed for life and upward mobility. In 1787, during slavery, two local pastors named Richard Allen and Absalom Jones founded the Free African Society. The society's main goal was to provide aid to newly free Blacks so that they could gather strength to develop leaders in the community. And, and understand this and its significance, the, the Free African Society was funded by the benevolence offerings and donations of other Black people trying to foster stability and upward mobility in their own lives. There was so much relief and encouragement that came from that, that this is founded by two preachers that came, that, that came from the Free African Society. Um, and when they found it difficult to, to uh, find jobs because their um, majority culture preferred free labor over paying for it, it was the Free African Society founded by, again, preachers that helped them make it. Black churches also gave birth to several credit unions to provide housing, educational loans to African-Americans during the Jim Crow era. Um, we had Dr. McMickle, Marvin McMickle on our podcast some time ago, and he talked about his church that he's the pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. And when African-American soldiers came back from war in, 1990, in 1945, they were denied loans uh, from banks and to get mortgages after they had fought in World War II for American freedom, but they couldn't get loans from their own country they risked their lives to save. It was black churches like Antioch who organized credit unions so that these soldiers and other black people that were kind of um, left out of the banking system, they organized these credit unions so people could get homes, 
uh, provide for their families and also send their children to school. I could go on and on about um, the past contributions of black churches, um, the civil rights movement, the March on Selma, um, the fact that the NAACP conducted most of their businesses in pews of black churches, um, that the black church was a refuge for, for black people in times of slavery and Jim Crow when they were in despair and in trouble. They sung songs to God during this time to help them make it through. And most of the current freedom that black people experience today has a lot to do with black churches in America. Black churches brought about lasting change because of spirit-filled men and women comprised like Richard Allen, the founder of um, the African Methodist Episcopal denomination, the first black um, denomination. Charles Octavius Booth, which developed a black systematic uh, theology book uh, that has been reprinted today, um, Apologetics and plain, plain Theology for Plain People that I encourage you all to get. Jarena Lee, uh, one of the first women preachers um, to be ordained, Rebecca Prodden, um, a missionary evangelist in her own right, J.D. Otis Roberts, um, a, a liberation theologian. Each of these men and women had a deep abiding faith in Jesus Christ that compelled them to live generously, sacrificially, and intentionally for the sake of others. Richard Allen and the Free African Society acceptance of Acts chapter two, verses 43 through 37 as a model for church compelled them to generously give and share everything they had with one another. It was Rebecca Pryden's belief that Christ died for everyone so that those who received new life would no longer live for themselves, that compelled her to live sacrificially for the spiritual and bodily freedom of others. It was Octavia, Charles Octavius Booth's and J.D. Otis Roberts' conviction that every man and woman was created in the image of God that compelled them to intentionally labor for the theological education and liberation of others. Before these men and women were activists, they were followers of Christ. You see, Black churches have brought about lasting change because of men and women who comprised it and their faith in the God of the Bible. It is important that our churches today grab onto the testimony and the work of Black churches in America for us to see lasting change in our culture and community. It was scripture that fortified the efforts of Martin Luther King Jr., Jr. Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and a host of others. It was their faith in God's scriptures that gave Black churches their life. And it will be the same scriptures that awaken our generation and assure the vitality of all churches in the future. So with that being said, how should black churches approach shape our apologetic today? Number one, if we look at, at what we just what we just discussed about black churches, one thing we could pull out from black churches in our apologetic thinking about how I defined apologetics as a more holistic approach, informational and incarnational, and this contributions. And thinking about today, we can see that the black church can help us provide a holistic approach to apologetics that encompasses justice, social and economic justice. We see that Richard Allen, the founder of the AME denomination made it a point not only to provide a worship space for those uh, African free Africans in Philadelphia, but he also made sure that their social and economic needs were met with the free African society. That he was not just um, concerned with their soul being safe, but he was uh, concerned with their conditions in this present life and making sure they had a quality of life. And he had a holistic approach to meeting their need that showing um, them the love of Christ 
was not limited to their salvation, but also his love was demonstrated through caring about their needs, their social and economic needs. And I think if we want to make inroads in a culture and a generation that's increasingly uh, passionate about social and economic justice, then we need to be a church that demonstrates care for the social and economic needs of our communities, those on the margins. How are we living out our life incarnationally to embody the message of Christ, to show the love of Jesus, to meet and care for the needs? How are we looking out for the least of these um, in our communities? And I think that's one of the things that we can learn from Black churches and how to have an effective apologetic today to reach culture. But that's not, that's not the only way. Um, one of the biggest responses that we get from culture, from millennials, Gen Z, and it's not just them, the Gen X and boomers have this same, um, same challenge, some of them, but I think Gen Z and millennials more than others, is that they want to know how to navigate through church hurt or toxic church experiences or negative experiences with people in the faith. And I think here the black church, particularly, um, I wanna highlight Richard Allen in this, um, because the black church, the formation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and Richard Allen came out of his experience at St. George Church in Philadelphia. Richard Allen was worshiping and um, Absalom Jones and others Africans were worshiping at St. George Church, a majority white church in Philadelphia. And when they were not allowed uh, to pray in the same spaces as their white counterparts, um, they were not treated as fully human. Um, they were beaten when they tried to worship in the space that their white counterparts were worshiping in. And so they experienced church hurt physically and emotionally. They, they experienced it in all forms, but they didn't allow that hurt to push them away from Christ. They understood uh, the, the misuse of scripture by man and the gospel message of Christ to be two separate things. So they, they didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but they created a space where they could worship God, the God of the Bible as they read it um, with freedom and liberty. And they created a space in which they were not looked down upon and looked as less than, and they were seen as people that were made also in the image of God. And so I think as we think about a generation that's dealing with church hurt, we can learn from Richard Allen and Absalom Jones and those that were with them in the formation of the Af African Methodist Episcopal denomination. How do we navigate this? How do we show people that there's a way to reject the toxic church experience, but still hold on to the gospel message? This is church hurt is not new but it is a real stumbling block as we engage people who have had um, not so good experiences with church. We could point them back to the formation of the black church to say the formation of the black church was a formation that was um, keen on keeping the gospel message central and living out the gospel message so that people could see the light of Christ in spite of the misuse of white churches. And this leads me to my last point. It helps us to reintroduce Christianity to the world. Black churches, in a real sense, help reintroduce Christianity to black slaves in a way that was disconnected from the toxic misuse that their slave owners had fed them. And so, they had to reintroduce Christianity. And I think we're in a space in our culture where people have not been introduced to authentic Christianity. They have seen a politicized Christianity. They have seen a cultural Christianity, but they've not seen the Christianity 
that comes from scripture. And God is giving us an opportunity to reintroduce Christianity to the world in the same way that our African brothers and sisters had to reintroduce Christianity, not only to African slaves, but they had to challenge um, their white slave owners to say, hey, you're using scripture incorrectly. This is what scripture says. And I'm made in the image of God too. And so I think that those are three things that we can take from the black church. It will help us to provide a holistic approach to apologetics that encompasses justice. It will help us to help people who've experienced church hurt to be able to separate uh, the people that hurt them versus the Christ that saved them. And it will help us reintroduce Christianity to the world. I, I hope that through this lecture um, that you can have a better sense of how we can engage um, society through apologetics and that these lessons from the Black church help you feel better equipped to, to engage your community and to strengthen your local body. Um, I'm excited to, to, take, to take your questions now. Wow, thank you so much, Ms. Lisa. That was an awesome and phenomenal, wow, talk and so inspiring to see how the Black church has been so instrumental in helping to shape and form so many people, not only in this country, but I think it has been instrumental in, in impacting people around the world um, in matters of justice and being able to really represent Christ and the gospel in a real way. So I thank you so much. We do have an opportunity now you all to ask some questions of Ms. Fields, uh, of Lisa, while we have her here, she would prefer to be called Lisa, so I want to honor that. Um, and we just want to thank you for that. And also wanted to give you all an opportunity to be directed to the Jude 3 project. If you have questions and want to find out more about her organization and the work that they are doing there, which is phenomenal, you can go to Jude, the, the number three, project.org, Jude 3 project.org. But in the meantime, if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll be more than happy to get those answered for you. And while we are waiting for our first question to come up, I do have a question, um, if you don't mind. Sure. Oh, there's a first question that came in here. I'll allow them to ask questions and I, if there's time at the end, I'll ask mine. Okay, here's the first question. What might it look like for other ethnic groups to ethnically come alongside and partner with the Black church in their work today and in the future? Would you like me to repeat it? What might it look like for other ethnic groups to ethnically come alongside and partner with the Black church in their work today and in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the Black church is always looking for partners. I think about um, uh, MLK's letter from the Birmingham jail. And one of his, um, his uh, pushbacks was that he wasn't receiving support uh, from other ethnic groups, especially white churches in the fight for justice. So we see historically that the black church is looking for ethnic supporters and we're not looking for people to come and just assimilate to uh, to the black community, but we're looking for people to authentically live out the gospel message alongside us. And I think that's the call of the gospel for us to all work together, um, that we all have something significant to add um, to the efforts. That's why we're the body of Christ. No one uh, aspect of the body is more important than others, but we are all to join together, um, to work together. So that it, I think that looks like seeing for your ethnic group, what is your, or your particular church, I won't go as general as a, as an ethnic group, but your particular church, if it's a majority white church, what resources can you contribute to black churches that may be underserved and come alongside as a partner, not to take over, but seeing what, you, what they're doing in the community, 
what needs they may have and how can you, what you have and your resources help benefit the work they're doing. So I think that's one tangible, tangible way. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think those are great. Uh, that's a great recommendation. Um, the next question that we have here is you mentioned how uh, the Black church is not a monolith and the history of the Black church, how prevalent it was in the communities, how powerful they were with even opening up HBCUs and being involved in justice matters. And so last night I was in a training, I'm teaching uh, a class on rethinking and re rethinking incarceration, right? And I had a brother who was of Latino descent say last night that he saw the Black church historically as being unified and when they went out and they had any protests or did anything, it all came from what seemed to be one unified voice moving forward. And so he said, why is it that nowadays we have um, what seems to be disjointed unity? You know, especially when it comes to matters of like Black Lives Matter and um, some people coming from it from different political, um, you know, viewpoints and perspectives. And so I, I had some thoughts around why that has changed just because of the nature of the way that, that the communities are not exactly the same and that mindsets have shifted and changed. But do you have anything to speak to about how we as the church can be more unified possibly, you know, in some of these matters? And what do you think uh, could be some recommendations moving forward to, to help others who wanna come alongside of us who may not have had the experience of being in a black church growing up and what that could look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I think there's this, uh, this misnomer for the social involvement of black churches during the civil rights movement in particular. Uh, I think about, uh, I, th I believe it's J.H. Jackson in Chicago who wouldn't let uh, MLK speak at his church and he's a historically black church. So I think there is a, a misunderstanding that all black churches were behind King. Uh, there was a lot of black churches who didn't like King's approach. Um, and I think that us knowing that and us thinking through that helps us see that this disjointed and disunity is not new to us. Uh, I think the difference is I think that our culture was more communal in that space. And so it was easier for us to see another, get behind a particular cause. Um, while I think as we're growing, just as, as the West altogether, we're becoming more individualistic. And so that causes more uh, disunity because everybody's more concerned with their own interests. And so I think, you know, one of the things we have to do is get people in a more communal mindset. And that's hard for us. That's easier for those in the East, uh, easier for people on the, on the continent uh, because that's just how they think naturally. But in the West, we're more individualistic. And I think as we move from civil rights era to this era, we see individualism continually creeping into our community in ways that create this unity. If everybody's serving their own interests, it's hard to be unified. And so I think we have to, in churches, talk about communal, talk about uh, one another's um, and how we serve other people, how we lay our lives down for other people in order for us to be unified to help those who are on the margins. Great, thank you so much for that question, answering that question, appreciate it. So we have a couple more here. Um, this question comes from our Dean, Dr. Powell, and he asks, how do we address issues of justice and racism without being perceived to be promoting a particular political agenda? Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we have to be willing to be, uh, not, be not be afraid to be identified um, in a wrong way. What I mean by that, uh, I heard a pastor say, Jesus wasn't afraid to be guilty by association. And the people in which he was around, because they saw him with different people, 
they started pegging him different ways. But he didn't let the ways in which people might think about him detour him from connecting to who really needed him. And I think we have to get out of our own head and not be so consumed with what people may say about us if we know we're doing what God has called us to do. If God has called us to, to care about those on the margins, we shouldn't be afraid of being labeled because Jesus wasn't afraid of being labeled. He didn't hear what they were saying and say he hangs out with sinners and say, you know what? Disciples, we can't hang with them anymore. He wasn't afraid to talk to the woman at the well. He wasn't afraid to touch people that were considered unclean. Um, he wasn't afraid. And so I think in order to, to live out this walk, to live out the gospel message, we have to be like Jesus. And we have to have courage and not be afraid to be of what people may say about us in order to live out the gospel message. Thank you for that, Lisa. I really appreciate your um, candor here and wanted to just have a caveat to that question. So we do know that it takes boldness, it takes courage, and sometimes going against the brain. Perceptions can be um, damaging, however, from others who are outside, right? And mm -hmm. so we think about like, how do we balance that when you have donors and mm -hmm. people who are going to be <laughs> pouring into your organization who may not like what you are promoting, but you still want to be um, gospel centric and promote justice and those other things. Any thoughts around that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm glad you brought that caveat because that is a real space where people like I, my financial, uh, <laughs> how I live is tied into donors who may have a set of beliefs. And I think one, candidly, we have to sometimes be willing to lose donors because sometimes donors handcuff us from doing the mission of Christ and it's gonna hurt us in the long run. But on a, on a, that's a one, that's one, but I think that would be the most extreme one. Um, but I think on a practical level, I think there's some coaching that could be done with donors, donor relationships and saying, hey, this is the direction we feel like God is calling us to go. And these are the reasons. And we feel like we're not living out the gospel message if we're not fulfilling these reasons. I think sometimes if we have donors that have a particular belief system, if we don't, if the first time they see our stance is in public, then we hinder, I think, the communication. Um, but I think what would be helpful is if you know you're about to shift a different direction that you haven't been going, is have the conversation first with the donor base to say, hey, I know you're used to us not speaking on this, but because we feel the Lord's leading, this is where we want to speak on it. Now, are you gonna be with us? Or are you gonna be against us? And I think it takes the courage as an organization, as a person to know that you you might lose. I think about Jesus saying, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many people left and he looked and said, will you also go? And he said, where can I go? You have the words of eternal life. And so I think in that same way, we have to be willing to let people go if they're if they're going to go, um, because that's the, that's the cost of, of righteousness. And if we want culture to let the, their idols go, we have to be willing, if money has become an altar idol in our ministry, to let some of that go. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. The next one is from Dominique. And it says, what role do you foresee the Black church playing in confronting injustices that continue to adversely impact the Black community, especially with the emergence of secular Black organizations such as Black Lives Matter and BYP 100? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that is. So I think the, that's a great question. I think the Black church has a, a crucial role in this day, and I, I'm excited to see more Black churches lead. I think we've kind of fell back um, in a way, and so you have BLM and um, BYOP 100, I think they, they listed um, taking the lead, Color of Change, these other organizations leading the way of justice advocacy. And so the church has to, to be more, more strategic. Um, and that comes, I think, 
because those generations are those organizations are usually led by young people the black church one of the major challenges for black churches is the recruitment of younger the younger generation and so the older the gen x the boomers are tired and they just like <laughs> they're coming but they don't have the energy and so we need black church has just to get a little bit more um a little better with recruitment of the younger generation if we're going to be able to have those robust social and economic um, empowerment rallies um, like we used to see in the civil rights movement because those are young people leading that movement for the most part dr king is a young man um, the college students with them um, that's young people and so I think we need to just, once we have the young people back in our pews energized, then we will see, I think, social change. Le us leading the way in social change. Great, thank you so much for that answer. Appreciate that. All right, so we have one more question here and this is for Craig. Um, the question is, Jamar Tisby suggested one way to move forward was to possibly start a new seminary. He said some new things may need to be done outside of the existing ways and institutions of how things are done. Do you have any thoughts around this, a new seminary? Yeah, um, I think that's a great point. I think um, one of the things we see, there's a, for a lot of seminaries, there's a challenge for recruitment across the board. So I think we, if there was a, a seminary created, it would have to be very innovative and teaching style flexibility, uh, which most seminaries have because they have online courses and, and things, but really very much contextualized and state of the art in order for it to be more attractive uh, for African-Americans because what people are thinking about like student debt, it, is it gonna make sense for me to accrue all this debt uh, to go to seminary if the job I'm getting after doesn't pay for the uh, the the education or degree if it's if it's going to be a burden so i think it just those things have to be considered um as if we think about a new seminary thank you so much for that um i i agree those are some big considerations that need to be made as well mm -hmm. <laughs> all right there's one more question here it says what are some steps that older black churches can take to reach the younger generation since you said that it is that it's significant that we reach younger generations what are some steps older black churches can take to reach those younger folks yeah i think reaching out to the young people that that left we do a series called why I don't go for Jew three where I sit down with young adults who have left the church to ask them kind of why they left and do Q and a but I think that's a good start because you you can't count you have to assess where, what went wrong with those who already left in order to move forward and creating something new so I think and and that's easier for people who are still in the church because usually those who are left are their children and grandchildren so acts having honest candid conversations what what made you leave without judgment so listening and being quiet and just letting them vent their concerns which is definitely sometimes harder for older generations uh to let to let people vent about their frustrations especially when it comes to church and so i think that would be a good place to start and then making your your church space uh a space where i feel like it's a where i, where I call it a free to act space that you're free to ask questions about things in the Bible, about church that you don't understand. And you are equipped with resources to answer those questions. So I think open dialogue about why people left, free to ask spaces and also robust um, civil, social and economic engagement, I think are ways to help recruit young people back to churches. Those sound like great recommendations to me. Thank you so much for sharing, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, so you all, we have um, just a few moments left and there is still room in the Q&A field, not necessarily the chat, but if you wanna type a question into the Q&A, maybe we can take one more and then we'll move forward. And while we're waiting on that last question to, to come in, is there anything additional you wanna add? 
Lisa? Uh, I can't think of it. If you want uh, more tips on engaging culture, we do have a pastors and church leaders conference coming up in March. And uh, the, the title of the conference is called Preaching in the Culture. Mm -hmm. So we'll be talking about uh, LGBTQ, we'll be talking about justice, economic justice, we'll be talking about the authority of scripture, all the things that, that the next generation is wrestling with, um, mm -hmm. how to, to live a life that doesn't undercut the message. Um, so you can register for that at preachingandculture.com. Great, preachingandculture.com. And is that going to be uh, virtual? Yes, it's virtual. All right, thank you. Okay, so it does not look like another question has come in. Um, and so I am going to go ahead and start moving us toward the closing because there's a couple of announcements to make. Thank you for putting that in this preachingculture.com. Um, on next Tuesday, we're gonna have Mike Woodruff come in and he is going to continue. He will be in chapel and he will continue the series on why I am a Christian. And so I would encourage you all to go ahead and attend that next week. It's been a phenomenal series and I think you will enjoy hearing him speak. And I also wanted to share that the next time we do a Thursday event similar to this, we will have Miss Rebecca McLaughlin come in and she will speak and that will be held on March 17th. So um, those are some of the things I wanted to talk about in the closing. And if any other questions have come up quickly. Nope. Okay. So we do want to thank you all for attending today's subversive orthodoxy lecture. Again, our next lecture will be on the 17th with uh, Rebecca McLaughlin, and you will be able to also um, attend chapel next week to hear from Mike Woodridge. Really appreciate you all coming in today. I want to go ahead and Thank you, Lisa, for all that you have poured into us. It has been such a blessing to hear about the legacy of the Black church and what we can do for it to um, engage both wings of our apologetics, where we both have the information and are able to defend the faith, but also are walking it out and allowing people to see it, and so that we can have a more holistic view of apologetics. And I really appreciate it all that you shared with us today. Thank you all for coming out and for attending. For those of you who bravely asked questions, we really appreciate your participation. For those of you who are in the chat, we also thank you for your engagement and commentary. And what we're gonna do now is just go ahead and pray out and you will be free to continue on with your day. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for this time we've had together. We thank you for your presence in this space. We appreciate Lisa and all of the work that she and her team are doing over at the Jew 3 Project. Lord, we ask that you would help us to have a more robust understanding of apologetics and to be able to not only defend the faith in a way that honors and glorifies you, God, but that would bring more people into the fold that they may see that Christianity is a religion for all people, that it is your heart's desire that your people will be, come, will be reconciled back unto you. And we thank you that you have given us tools and ways and examples, not only through the Black church, but through Christianity, the history of it overall, where we can um, do the work that you have called us to do in a way that glorifies and honors you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' mighty name. We seal this meeting under the blood, and we thank you for all that you have done here today. Amen. All right, everyone. So we want to thank you for your time here and enjoy your day. Have a blessed one. Thank you.